on and talk about what's happening in the world of taxation. According to a CBDT circular, FPIs have been brought under the ambit of indirect transfers. So we um, decode this for us. So uh, this is circular that a lot of people within the taxation universe have been talking about since yesterday. Uh, the CBDT put out a clarification, I believe, yesterday through this. Essentially, what the understanding is that now it is going to bring investors, investors who are investing in India-centric funds within the tax ambit. And in fact, the provisions of indirect transfers will start applying to these investors. Rima, what was happening earlier was that <clears throat> Invest, investors didn't have to bother with taxation. Essentially, if a fund is deriving more than 50% of its value uh, through underlying Indian assets, they could be shares of Indian companies, then these provisions will start applying. And it will apply to all investors who hold voting rights in excess of 5%. So if you're an individual investor or if you're an institutional investor but you don't own more than 5% of the total voting rights in that fund, then they don't apply to you. But if your holding is above this 5% threshold, then you will have to start uh, looking at certain um, taxation laws that would be applicable under the indirect transfers provision. The question is, is it going to be impacting fund flows into India? Will it impact investor sentiment, uh, international investors that are investing into the Indian equity market through these offshore funds? Well, let's discuss Discuss us further with the Puneet Shah of Dhruva Advisors, who's joining us now on the phone line. We also will have uh, Tejas Desai of uh, EY in just a bit. But Puneet, your thoughts first. Is this something that the market would perhaps get a bit worried about? I would believe uh, definitely yes. Um, the fact that there are 20 FAQs which are issued by the CBDT, um, all those 20 questions were raised by the FPIs with the tax authorities. Uh, to seek clarification. And if you look at those uh, FAQs, uh, the clearly uh, FPIs are saying that uh, it is impossible for them to comply with this indirect transfer tax uh, regime of India, where overseas investors are transferring their stake or they are selling their stake. And um, uh, they would have to withhold tax, they would have to pay tax in India, they would have to comply with the Indian tax regime, regulations, compliances, which, uh, to my mind, seem virtual impossibility. And therefore, this representation which was made with, uh, with the CBDT to, um, uh, 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 to represent that uh, this provision should not apply to them, while the FAQs have come out, the clarifications have come out, which clearly says that all the laws mm. as it is would apply to all the FPIs and their investors and therefore, they need to comply with these regulations. To my mind, it's a big, big blow. Mm. Uh, it will create a lot of disruption and a lot of compliance issues for the FPIs in India. Okay, let's uh, bring in uh, Tejas into the conversation as well. Tejas, same question to you. Now we understand broadly what the department is talking about, that if you're an investor into a fund that's primarily dedicated to India, that's deriving more than 50% of its value from underlying Indian assets, they could be Indian company shares, uh, then there would be an incidence of taxation. Is this going to impact fund flows that are coming into these offshore funds? Yeah, so look, I'm, uh, I'm not a stock market analyst, but uh, one thing I can definitely say that, you know, when the large uh, India-focused funds or the large emerging markets funds with a significant India allocation, when they look at this circular, they are certainly not going to like it. Because what you are doing here is essentially uh, those who are big on India, uh, the circular is going to impact them. It is going to impose on them significant compliance burden. Uh, they'll have to track the exits of their investors, withhold taxes, deposit them into the uh, Indian Treasury. All of this is uh, something which is uh, you know, very, very different from how the international markets operate. Mm. And to that extent, uh, I do think that uh, this is uh, going to impact those funds and they are not going to like it. Puneet, if you could clarify to us what is going to be the incidence of taxation, what's going to be this, this rate of tax that will be applied? Right now, nobody was paying it, so it was zero. Uh, and is there any clarity from which financial year is this applicable? Right. So I think, uh, yeah, um, two, three, two, three questions uh, which you raised and answers are fairly simple. And, uh, and very difficult. So um, the law is very clear that if the tax incidence is applicable as per, as per the current provisions, then the tax rate would be as high as 15% for the short-term capital gains and 
um, it would be uh, sorry, it would be actually 30 or 40 percent for short-term capital gains, uh, depending on the structure, and it could be 20 percent for the long-term capital gains, which is more than one year, um, uh, because these are not listed shares in India. These are shares or units of the FPI overseas, and therefore the concessional treatment, uh, to my mind, won't be available to the overseas investors, and therefore there's a very huge incidence of tax uh, which they would face in this situation. Similarly, uh, as, you, as you are aware, this law came because of the Vodafone controversy where uh, the overseas transfer happened and the value in the form of Indian company was in India and therefore overseas transfer was taxed between Vodafone and Hutch. Um, uh, and the law was then amended retrospectively from 1961 onwards. So, Essentially, this law as such sure. uh, is applicable retrospectively and therefore is applicable to uh, to every transfer uh, which is happening now. So it's already operational and okay. that's what the circular says in so many words. That That is a pretty important point. Quick last take, uh, Tejas, a little short on time. Again, your interpretation of the applicability of this. Yeah, so I think I agree with, uh, with what Puneet is saying. The law is clearly applicable retrospectively from... April 1, uh, 1961, but really what the tax office can do, you know, is to go back uh, seven years under the law, uh, and that's something that we need to watch out for, that how do they apply this circular in the context of A, existing assessments, and B, in the context of assessments that have already been completed, and where the tax office has the time to go back seven years uh, under the law to reopen those cases. So that's, that's something that, you know, one will need to really watch out for in terms of how this is applied on the ground by the tax administration. All right, gentlemen, many thanks for joining in with those uh, quick pointers and some details of something that, of course, uh, the entire taxation circle is talking about. And, of course, fund managers increasingly noticing this, trying to figure out uh, the impact that it might have. Okay, thank you for putting that in context. Let's slip into a very short break on the other